Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be reading a section from The Boy Who Dared by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. We are going to be picking up where we left off yesterday on page 110, right at the middle of the page break, right here. Okay. By June, it seems as though Hitler can do no wrong. The Nazis have overrun Greece and Yugoslavia. Some countries join the Germans, Yugoslavia, Greece, Bulgaria, Italy, and Romania. One Saturday night, Helmuth is eating dinner with Muddy and Hugo, a rare occurrence since Helmuth has moved in with his grandparents. Helmuth spears the potato dumpling with his fork when Hugo says, Have you heard your old friend Heinrich Warb has been arrested? Arrested? For what? That old fool, says Hugo, doesn't know enough to keep his mouth shut, to keep his opinions to himself. He spouted off about a Nazi salute. What did he say? asks Muddy, clearly worried. Hugo shakes his head in disbelief. Another Nazi butcher that we must salute. That's what he said. What does he think he's going to gain? He knows the law. How could they arrest an old man, says Muddy. Hugo pounds the table with his fist. We're at war. We can't permit such defeatist talk. Complainers and grumblers, doubters and agitators, they only serve to embolden the enemy. Muddy grows quiet. Helmuth pushes himself away from the table. Doesn't feel like eating. He leaves the flat, doesn't feel like going home to his grandparents. He walks along the river bile and watches the water sweeping past. His head throbs with sorrow and anger and distrust. It's just as Heinrich Mann said, no one is willing to go against the current, to take a stand. Life is too short to think about others. The next day, Helmuth finds Rudy and Carl before church. I have terrible news, says Helmuth. The Gestapo arrested Brother Warbs. Heinrich Warbs, says Carl. Why? Helmuth tells them what Hugo had said, that Brother Warbs was denounced by someone who heard him criticize the Nazis, and now he was taken into protective custody. Protective custody, says Carl sarcastically. And where are they protecting him? Noongam, says Helmuth. Not a place for a 66-year-old man, says Rudy, his voice filled with sympathy. It is well known that Nuengam is a concentration camp near Hamburg, notorious for its subhuman conditions where brutal guards force prisoners to do hard labor with inadequate food and live in squalid cells. We have no one to blame but ourselves, says Helmuth. The Nazis tell us what to think, what to feel. They tell us to hate and we call it love. They tell us to denounce our neighbors and we call it patriotism. But look what they do to people who dare to challenge them, says Carl. They crush dissent any way they can. It's June 22, 1941, a hot summer day, and the boys meet after work at the community swimming pool at Olsdorf. They shake out their towels, spread them on the grass. Through loudspeakers surrounding the pool, a Schubert sonata plays, violins and cellos. Carl and Rudy are discussing Hitler's closest friend and third highest Nazi, Rudolf Hess, who has been missing for several weeks. The Nazis claim that Comrade Hess met with an accident over the North Sea while piloting a fighter plane. The Führer says Hess was deranged, in no condition to fly, says Carl. Apparently, he's been suffering hallucinations. Do you think he's dead? asks Rudy. He's not deranged or dead, says Helmuth without thinking. He's sitting in a British jail. Rudy and Carl move closer. How do you know that? asks Rudy. Helmuth realizes he has given himself away. The BBC announced Hess's desertion weeks ago. Hess has com commandeered a fighter plane and landed in Glasgow, Scotland, where he was captured. The BBC called it the greatest escape in history. Helmuth toys with the idea of telling his friends the truth. He knows he can trust them, but he doesn't get the chance to answer. Suddenly, the music stops, interrupted by a strident-voiced announcer. A-chung, says the newscaster. Attention! At 4.15 this morning, German troops crossed the Soviet border, and our Luftwaffe began to bomb Soviet naval air bases, destroying one quarter of the Russian air force. At 6 a.m., the Führer declared war on Russia. There is a flare of military music, and then Adolf Hitler's voice comes over the radio. German people! shouts Hitler. At this moment, an attack of unprecedented in the history of the world in its extent and size has begun. The purpose of this front is no longer the protection of the individual nation, but the safety of Europe and therefore the salvation of everyone. May God help us in this battle. All around, 
Men, women, and children freeze in their places, stone still. Their faces are worried. They swallow hard, speak in hushed whispers. Now we're fighting the British and the Russians, says Carl. This will take double the troops and military supplies, whispers Helmuth. Every day that Germans spend at the Russian front will be a gain for the British. But we've got the best army in the world, says Rudy. And if Hitler wins Russia, think of what it will give him. Russian airplanes and tanks and guns. But Helmuth knows different. No one in history has ever conquered the Russians. Now how many more people will have to die? On the RRG, Helmuth hears how the advancing Germans capture or kill great numbers of Russian soldiers, but the RRG never lists German losses. And so, for the truth, Helmuth turns into the BBC. Late each night, he opens the hall closet and takes out the Rolla radio. He locks the flat door and then hears a different story about German planes destroyed by the Russians, sunken transport ships, and soldiers killed or captured. The Russians are fighting bitterly and bravely, but only Helmuth seems to know. When the BBC broadcast ends, he has trouble falling asleep. The BBC keys him up, makes him hate Hitler and the Nazis and their secrets and lies all the more, makes him ache with worry for Gerhard. Some mornings, Oma comments on the dark circles under Helmuth's eyes. She presses her hand against his forehead to check for fever. Are you getting enough sleep? she asks. I'm fine, Oma. He says, there's nothing to worry about, but he knows plenty that worries him. And one warm August night, as Helmuth walks with Carl along the bill, their talk turns to the war in Russia. The German people have been asked to donate woolen and fur clothing for the soldiers at the Russian front, where winter comes early. All of the fur and woolen clothing can't prepare our soldiers for winter in Russia, says Carl. Our luck can't hold, says Helmuth. No army has ever won Russia, not even Frederick the Great or Napoleon. If we stop now, we'd have Austria, the Sudetenland, and Poland, says Karl. Isn't that enough? Europe isn't enough for Hitler, Helmuth says bitterly. Hitler believes that world peace can come only through German domination. The two friends walk on in silence. The secrets Helmuth keeps to himself weigh heavier with each step. He thinks of Heinrich Mann and feels selfish. God gave him the ability to think for himself, and yet he fears doing what he knows is right. He longs to share the truth with Carl. Excuse me. You know what I think, he says to Carl. I'm afraid to ask, answers Carl. Helmuth lowers his voice. Our government is lying to us. That's what I think. Carl winces and draws away. It's dangerous to think that much, he says. Freedom has always been dangerous, says Helmuth. Come to my place tonight and I'll prove the Nazis are lying. But wait until after nine, until after my grandparents go to bed. After a frugal supper of cabbage and carrot soup and Lieberwurst, liver sausage, Helmuth hurries Oma as they clear away the dishes. Finally, Oma and Oprah retreat to their bedroom and latch the door behind them. Helmuth paces in the living room and listens for footsteps. At last, he hears feet shuffle outside in the flat. Before Carl has a chance to knock, Helmuth swings open the door. He ushers him in, his finger to his lips, signaling for quiet. So, what is it? whispers Carl. What sort of proof do you have? You'll see, says Helmuth. He eases open the closet, takes out the roll of shortwave radio, sets it on the kitchen table directly in front of Carl. Carl swallows hard. Are you crazy? He gingerly touches the raised roll of lettering, as if afraid it will shock him. But then his eyes shine with interest. What can you hear on it? You'll see, says Helmuth, as he rigs up the wire antenna. He turns out the kitchen light, snaps on the radio. The radio hums to life. Its dim amber light casts an eerie glow in the darkness. Helmuth turns the dial. The radio crackles and squawks, interrupted now and then by a soothing French voice, then a wisp of a violin and a quiet French horn, and then the first four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony crackle from the speaker, followed by an announcer who says in crisp German, The BBC London presents the news in German. Carl bolts upright. That's England! Helmuth gives Carl a triumphant look. Settle down, he says. You don't want to wake my grandparents. He adjusts the volume. What if someone hears us, says Carl. 
Helmuth hears the nervousness edging Carl's voice. He nods toward the flat door and tells Carl, You don't have to stay if you're afraid. Carl shakes his head, settles himself firmly in the chair. I'm not afraid, he says. Good, says Helmuth, but he understands Carl's fear. His own heart pounds each time he listens to the BBC. It is every good German's duty to report enemy propaganda to the Gestapo, to turn in anyone suspected of listening to or reading enemy propaganda. Helmuth tries not to think about the danger. The news that night is all about the Russian campaign. It is nothing like the German reports. All week long, the RRG has boasted of great success in Russia, one battle victory after another with little or no German losses as the German army advances on Smolensk. But the BBC tells a different story. The Germans approached within rifle range, recounts the BBC broadcaster. Then the Russians opened up with grenades and machine guns. The Russian organized a bayonet counterattack and forced the Germans to retreat. The Nazis left behind 2,500 dead and wounded 30 tanks and Bren gun carriers, 80 motorcycles, almost 500 automatic weapons, 90 machine guns, and 45 mortars. Carl looks sickened. A bayonet charge? Helmuth feels sickened, too. He can't bear to think what Gerhard might face if he is sent to Russia. Do you think the BBC is telling the truth? asks Carl. Helmuth nods. The BBC reports give more details. They give their own casualties too, not just ours. They don't hide the news from the British people. They just give the information without telling us how to interpret it. He looks at Carl. I despise the Nazis. I hate the way they bully people. I hate the way they lie to us. And I hate them telling me what to think. But... What can we do? Look what happens when people speak out. They are arrested, taken to camps. Some are never seen again. Look what they did to Brother Warbs. <sighs> I hate myself for doing nothing, says Helmuth bitterly. For allowing this to happen, everyone craves security, but gaining freedom means losing security. You sound like a bloody pamphlet, says Carl. Helmuth likes that. Do you want to listen again tomorrow, he asks. Carl grimaces and looks sheepish. My parents won't let me out every night. They're afraid I'll get caught in an air raid. Helmuth knows that Carl's parents are strict about curfew, especially his father, but he also senses his friend's fear of breaking the law. Carl leaves and Helmuth sits back at the table, presses his back against the chair. He twists the dial to the RRG and he listens. He grows angry all over again at its sudden lies. Suddenly, Carl's face floats in front of Helmuth. You sound like a bloody pamphlet. You sound like a bloody pamphlet. A bloody pamphlet. A pamphlet. Helmuth feels his thoughts changing, charging ahead to a dangerous place. Slowly, an idea rises to the surface, floats in front of Helmuth. He catches it, breathes it in, and, grip, and it grips him, won't let him go. He snaps on the light, takes out a piece of paper. Jots down everything he can remember from the BBC broadcast. By midnight, he has an essay titled, Who is Lying? The next night, Helmuth invites Rudy to listen to the radio. He doesn't mention that Carl listened the night before. It is safer that way. As soon as the announcer says, This is BBC London, Rudy nearly knocks over his chair. That's a shortwave, he cries. What if someone hears? No one will hear if you keep your voice down, says Helmuth. I have been listening for weeks now, and I am still here. Rudy looks unconvinced. But it's against the law. I won't force you, says Helmuth. You can leave now and never come back. Maybe someday you will find some courage. The words sting. Helmuth knows. He regrets hurting Rudy's feelings, but he tells himself that the words are for Rudy's own good. Rudy plants himself solidly in his chair. I'm staying. It's fine, Helmuth assures him. You want to know the truth, don't you? Throughout August, Helmuth listens to the BBC, one night with Carl and another night with Rudy. He feels guilty over this deception, but he knows it's best to meet separately for their own sake as well as his. They sit in the dark in the small flat lit only by the dim amber light of the radio and listen to the British voices pulsing across the crackling airwaves. It's thrilling, too, to know they're breaking the Nazi law. Breaking the law goes against their church teachings, but the boys feel sure that they have a responsibility to learn the truth. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll pick up again tomorrow.